It's been so great to track along with you, even when I'm not here, to be able to jump in online and to follow along as we have been uh, making this journey through the book of Mark. And by the way, if you've missed any of this series, if you've missed any of the series, um, when you're sitting on the soccer field watching your seven-year-old run around chasing the ball, grab, grab um, some of these messages from the past few months. And the easiest way to do that is on our app, right? Shameless plug. Make sure that you download the app and then on there, not only can you go back and visit all the messages, but there's also all kinds of information and stuff you can sign up for and do all that. Really would love that to be one stop. So make sure if you haven't done that already. But one of the most baffling things about Jesus that we've learned from kind of a broad perspective as we've made this journey through his life is that he showed up on the scene in the, in the core of his ministry and he would have been sort of proclaimed or titled as a religious leader. They would have said, man, this guy's a, he's a rabbi, he's a religious leader, and he would have sort of had that label be placed on him. But as we've learned over the past few months, he actually did not gravitate towards other religious people. Yeah. I mean, he was sent from God, but he really didn't seem to pursue the people who would have considered themselves the closest to God. And he was also well-liked. All right. And in our time, as well as in that time, those who lead with religion as kind of the label, those who lead that way, they're not normally that popular. They're not normally the ones who are listened to or well received. But Jesus was so different. Andy Stanley famously said it this way. He said, people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. So, so they, they didn't connect at all to what he was talking about most of the time. They didn't connect at all even to some of the things he was saying or doing. But for some reason, they were drawn to him. And the people, this is interesting, the people who were most comfortable with all of the religiosity, the, the temple and the garb that you would wear and all the activities and all the religious stuff, they were the most comfortable with that, but they were the most uncomfortable with Jesus. I mean, you read that over and over again. And the ones who were most uncomfortable with all those things, didn't show up at church all the time, didn't, didn't know anything about um, you know, God or any of those things, they were actually the ones most comfortable with him. If you want to do something fun, you're bored, whatever, um, after you download the app, if you want to do something fun, Go back and read through the book of Mark. You can literally read it in an hour or so. And go back. But what you'll notice is if you circled the word crowd, Every time you saw it and you read through it, it shows up all the time. Basically, when you read the narrative of Jesus' life, whenever he was out, he was teaching, he was really demonstrating the kingdom of God is here, there, were always, there was always a crowd that was around him. And that's a challenge for me personally and for us corporately because we are, the church, is his, we are his body. Right? So when, if we are the body of Christ, the things that would have been true of him should be reflective in us. Yes. So that leads to kind of a hard conversation with yourself. Yeah. Like, you know, do the people who were nothing like Jesus like me? Right? Like, do they, do, do, do they feel that same way? Because what is true of Jesus personally should be true of us collectively. Like together, like that was who Jesus was. So we are reflecting him. That is who we should be, right? And the fact is people were drawn to him. They were, man, they were so moved by it. That's why reading this, the gospel of Mark is so powerful and such a powerful reminder. They're challenged by his teaching, by, by his new priorities that he was putting out there, what the kingdom of God looked like by his perspective on life and what were important. They were compelled by what he had to say about God, his heavenly father. And they didn't believe everything that he said at that point, but they were drawn to him. They didn't understand everything, but they were drawn to him. What was true of him personally should be true of us collectively. We should be the most likable people in the community because of what, <laughs> excuse me, because of what Jesus has done in us and for us. And as a church at View, we've always had this mission. We really have. That we should, we should line up with the posture of Jesus collectively as a group. And this is important because if separately, each of us individually, we look a bit like Jesus, together, combined, we can look a lot 
like him. So we can be intentional both personally and corporately about the barriers that would stand in the way of someone coming face to face with Jesus and responding accordingly. Some of you are here today, you're watching online, and you, you're, you're kind of tiptoeing back in. Because somewhere in your past, I was listening to someone between services today tell me the story of, of, of their middle child and, and the prodigal journey that they've been on. And, and somewhere in the past, there was a hurt or there was harm done because of the barrier in the church that had nothing to do with Jesus. It had to do with the people who were representing wow. Jesus yeah. that now have become a barrier to that. And that's a, that's a heavy thing for us to carry, but we got to come face to face face with it. Now, one of the reasons Jesus was so hard to resist, even for people that were resistant to what he was saying, is that he actually would have viewed people and used different adjectives to describe them than we would. All right. We all have adjectives we use all the time, descriptors around people that we see. It normally, I'll just, I'll make it simple for you. It normally looks something like this. We just say those blank people. That's what it is. Those blank people and we just we just fill it in right those rich people down the street those rich people driving the tesla right those oh those poor 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 people right those educated people those uneducated people all of those terms that we use right and you know what you know what's true you go into a group you get into a setting and you kind of all of a sudden you try not to do it but you kind of go those are my people and over here those are not my people. I mean, they're okay, but I wouldn't golf with them or go on vacation with them, right? Have coffee with them, but those people, those are my, like you can, you can pick them out, right? We all fill in the blank. Those blank people, those good people, those bad people, those Republican people, those Democratic people, those Libertarian people, if there's still any of those around, those running people, those I don't run lame people that are out there. Those, those Peloton people, I have a Peloton, right? We fill it in. It's our fill in the blank instinct and it's not gonna completely go away or change. But what was different about Jesus is the way that people who were nothing like him were drawn to him because he prioritized everything differently. Those adjectives, those descriptors, he threw them all out and he viewed people in a whole entirely different way. We learned about this way back in Mark chapter two. At the very beginning when Jesus was introducing this new kingdom, in Mark chapter two, verse 17, he said, it is, this is why I'm here. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick, those sick people, right? I have not come to call the righteous, those righteous people, but sinners. And then today we get to Mark chapter 11 and we move beyond words and we actually get to a point where Jesus radically demonstrated this idea and this principle. And he's, as Kyle said, in the narrative here, which we're in Mark chapter 11, Jesus is entering Jerusalem. He's been on this entire journey. He's been in that whole area. He's preaching, teaching parables, healing people. And now he's entering Jerusalem. And those that are following him think something exciting is going to happen. He's been telling them this isn't going to end well, but they don't, they're not actually listening or paying attention or processing. So they're entering Jerusalem and they're thinking, we're going to take, we're, this is the moment, right? Like Jesus is going to send. We're going to be alongside him. We're establishing this new kingdom. Jesus knows something else is happening, right? He's headed towards this final journey to the cross. Right? And so the environment he enters first is very celebratory, but there is tension as well. Here's, here's where we pick it up. I'll read it to you. Because he immediately goes to the most holy place in Jerusalem, the temple, and that's where things get complicated. All right? He goes to church. And it always gets complicated when we go to church. Verse 15, here's what it says. It says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts. I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment to help you have a visual. And he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers, the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Verse 17. And, and as he taught them, right, he's throwing over the furniture. He taught them, he said, it is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for, read it with me, all all, this is important. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. Then the religious people, always have a commentary, chief priests, teach the law. They heard this and began looking for, they, they did not react well. They began to look for a way to kill him for they feared him because the whole crowd was shocked. They were amazed at his teaching. Now Mark mentions that Jesus entered the 
the temple area. This is significant because when you stepped into the temple, this is kind of a, a model of what it would have looked like. It's kind of massive, right? We always see the wall now, the last remaining wall. So this is what would have been there, prominent, big, lots of different sections that were there. And when you first entered in, the next picture will show you, there was this court of the Gentiles. You see it here. There were all these different spots where people were allowed to go or not allowed to go, depending on these things. But this is most likely, this court of the Gentiles, is most likely the spot where Jesus would have entered. Right? This, is, this is where everyone would have arrived. This was the only part of the temple complex where non-Jews were allowed to go. It was the biggest section of the temple, and you had to go through it to get to the rest. And all the business operations of the temple were set up there. It was nuts. I mean, when Jesus walked in, it would have been like, a, like one of those Saturday morning street fairs, right? It would have been like a farmer's market. Just picture it. Like you're trying to get into a place where you can have a connection with God. You're trying to get into a place where it's quiet and it's sacred. And yet when you walk in, it is just picture. Remember the old stock exchange back before everything was digital? Right? We'd always see that on the CNBC. There's all this, the, the traders are on the floor and they're screaming and they're yelling and papers going and the tickers going by. Just kind of picture that chaos except church. Right? So Jesus comes in and he looks around and it would have been busy. There's masses of animals and stalls. They're selling animals that would then be sacrificed inside. And they're exchanging money for, for all of the people who would be coming from all the regions around where their currency wouldn't be good. They're exchanging it, making a profit off of that exchange. And all of this is happening. And remember, this is the Passover week. So now there's just, they said there, there's just thousands and thousands of individuals who would be going through here some weeks a quarter million animals would be sacrificed during this Passover. So it was very lucrative. And Jesus walks in and he sees all of this chaos. Imagine coming to view next week and when you pull into the valet, I call it the valet. When you pull, I'm from Vegas. When you pull into the valet up front, next week some of you are going to pull in and just leave your car there. Don't worry, some of the dream team will be there to park it. Um, so you pull in, imagine, and then you have to navigate, right? Somebody's got, we've got Girl Scout cookies going on. We've got a fundraiser. We've got T-shirts. We've got this, that, and the other thing. And so imagine you're coming to church, but before you even get into the building, before you can even come to this place, where you've got to navigate all this. My wife and I love to go to Einstein's Bagels on Saturday. I know, it is what it is. And we go there on Saturday mornings. We have our bagel sandwich and our coffee. And over the last few months, there's always somebody set up outside. And it's a nonprofit. It's awesome cause. But every time we drive up and park now, we see the little card table with the person sitting there and we're like, oh, right? <laughs> I mean, again, it's a good cause. But the problem is we just want a bagel and coffee. Yeah. And so we've got to walk past this person and they're like, hey, good morning. Like they're looking for a donation. We're like, hey, right? And you just, you're like, shame, shame, shame. And all, again, all you want is a bagel and coffee. But imagine that multiplied, multiplied. Like all I want is to somehow experience this holy place. I can't even go into the holy of holies. I can't even go where the Jewish individuals can go. I just want to get in here. And now I'm surrounded by all of this, buy this, do this, do this other thing. And it is just like, I'm done, right? Like most of our reaction would be what? I'm out. Yeah. And so Jesus comes in and he just starts throwing things over. He's throwing furniture around. And as he's throwing the furniture around, all the religious leaders start running up to him. They already don't like him. And they're like hurrying over like, Jesus, is there a problem here? What is the situation? Why is this? You know, and he's just, right? He's just, he's just UFCing everything. Like, boom, right? You see that guy break his leg last night? Oh, gosh. Uh, um, just boom, like this, right? So Christians love UFC. I don't even know. I, that's a whole nother sermon for something. It's like Old Testament, like, comes in, and we're like, blood and all that. We love violence. We're scared of sex. But that's a whole nother sermon, all right? It, it's okay, all right? But here's the deal. So he's in there and he's tossing everything. He's, he's tossing everything around. And they're like, stop, stop. And here's why what's interesting is that they, in that day, their idea of the Messiah was when the Messiah would come, he would actually remove all foreigners from that worship area. So the Jews had this idea of like, well, when the Messiah comes, he's going to reestablish Israel and all that. And all the foreigners are going to basically. And so here's Jesus, this proclaimed Messiah, actually doing the opposite. He's actually removing all of these barriers, clearing all the barriers. Jesus was saying, whomever you put in the blank, those blank people, that's who I'm available to. 
Gentile, pagan, poor, unworthy, unfit, unemployed, unclean. And though we may think, well, Jesus was just angry because things were being sold, which he probably was, it was much more subversive than that. There was a deeper thing going on. He was challenging the actual system itself. He was challenging, he was challenging the adjectives that was that were constantly being placed in front of people that would limit their access to God. He was saying, everyone can now go directly to God. And some of you have experienced that. You've experienced an adjective being put in front of who you are. And it's been a challenge, an extra challenge for you to have access and to, and to experience God's grace because of that. And Jesus is turning over these tables in the courtyard. He's flipping over the obstructions, just steps from the Holy of Holies. Everyone is to be connected with him. That's how he saw people. And here's, here's the point, is Christ is available to everyone, everywhere. Or, if that's not true, he isn't available to anyone anywhere. Wow. Right? It's just, it is come as you are. So let's, let's get rid of all these barriers. Let's, let's see people as they are. When I was working on this message uh, two weeks ago, starting to just think about and write some of it and review it and all that, I'm sitting at this coffee shop in Vegas. That's the, it's hipster coffee shop. That's why I go there. So it's cool, right? So they're like, please come and sit in our coffee shop so all the cool people will come. So it's, um, that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> It's called Public Us. It's kind of like narrative, right? If you're cool, you go to narrative in Everett, right? This is kind of our version of narrative. And so um, I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm thinking about all this barrier stuff and I'm looking around the coffee shop. What's interesting is all of that is playing out in this moment. Like there's people sitting there, some people on their headphones like I was, some people are having a, a lunch, some people are having coffee, um, some people are like, there was a, you know, they're on their date, they're on a first date like a lunch date, it's awkward. And this coffee shop sits downtown on Fremont Street. I know none of you have ever been to Vegas, but if you ever come, you, Fremont Street. So it's this weird mixture of like, you know, kind of business people that are doing business, hipster people, honestly, that are just hanging out in coffee shops, starting, doing a startup of something. And then, um, and then homeless people literally outside, walking around, sleeping outside. So it's just this, it's this boom, right? And so I'm looking, I'm thinking, wow, how would Jesus describe this moment? How would he describe all these people sitting, all the people outside the window as I'm watching life go by? And I thought of these two adjectives. All the other ones we would put those, he would, he would basically just divide everybody into two categories and it, would, and it would drive his passion of the kingdom of God. He would say, these are those who are connected to me and these are those who are disconnected from wow. me. That's it. So all the, other, all the other adjectives wouldn't matter to him. It would just be like, where are they in relationship to me? Are they connected or are they disconnected? And we're his body. So that should, be, that should be our reflection that we give to the world. And I know it's really hard because people are just difficult. Sometimes my wife and I walk around, or we're in an airport, right? And you're just watching people. And we, I've honestly said this to him, I just don't know how God does it. Like, I just look at people, and I'm like, man, I don't know. Like, uh, come on, some of you have thought that same thing. Like, I don't know how God deals with these people. Like, they're just a wreck, and they're a mess, and they're, it's just, but he's God, right? And he puts us, he takes all of the stuff that we would judge and just puts us in that. And our adjectives should simply be his. Where are they with Jesus? Are they connected or are they disconnected? That's the question. Because that's how Jesus sees people. This is how he sees you and I. This is how he sees me. So in the temple courts that day, when Jesus is throwing furniture, it wasn't, he didn't see a mass of people, crowds bumping into each other, chaos everywhere. He simply saw the seemingly connected, those that were religious and could sit at the tables or could have access, and those who were struggling to get access. And he just wanted to reconnect them to his father. And that's how he sees everyone. The one, people in your neighborhood, the people you work with every day. If you're a student, the people on your middle school or high school campus, those who work on the first floor at the reception desk and those who have a corner office on the seventh floor. That's really the criteria of how Jesus fills in the blank. And that tells us why Jesus would throw tables over. Listen, the reason Jesus was drawn to people far from God is because they were far from God. Right? The reason Jesus was drawn to people who are lost is because they're lost. And that's who we should be drawn to. And here's the challenge for us, View Church and every church, 
is no matter what we try or say or do, the gravitational pull of every community of faith like this is towards those who are connected already. Towards you guys, you're here, right? So it's just, it's great like for you, but the gravitational pull of every organization like this is gonna be towards how do we meet the needs? How do we keep people connected here, right? While the world goes by day after day, and doesn't get it, right? Like you come here and you know, you know the drill, right? Like it's cool, like I pull up, I know what time to get here, I know where to take my kids, I know, I know where the coffee is in the back and the bath. I mean, I, you just know the drill, right? You know the, you know the songs, right? you know them pretty much, right? It's all those things. We, we, it's good, I mean, we want that, but it's just, we, we, if we're not careful, the gravitational pull of how we resource, how we spend time and money and energy as a church will always naturally, left unto itself, if we're not paying attention, will always gradually pull us towards those who are already here, those who are already, already connected. But we want to be that church that turns the tables over, right? Yeah. We want to be the church yeah. that even if people aren't here, they drive by and they see the cool reader sign with the time and temperature, which I appreciate, Kyle, that I know that every time I drive by. Um, <laughs> When they see that, they go, man, I've never been to that church, but I know that church. Like, I know them out in the community. I know who they are. I work with that person. That guy's my boss, and he goes to that church. And I don't know Jesus, but if I did go to church, or if I was interested in Jesus, I would want what that guy or that gal has. That's right? That's who we want to be, right? Yeah. But unfortunately, there's a drift. And, and what, what happens with the drift is eventually we, we set up barriers. Now, some of these are not our fault, but you guys know the narrative even out in our culture now. It's even harder than ever. The church has got this narrative. Church leaders have got this narrative that's actually made it more difficult. Let me give you three quick barriers that you, we're all dealing with, you as an individual and we as a church. The first one is a barrier of exclusion, right? That many people in our culture, they perceive that I am, that I am excluded because they would think, well, I know who the church likes and I know who the church doesn't like and I'm on the don't like list and so I'm excluded. And so they view the church as a whole, th th this is the barrier. It's, it's, what's interesting is they're not even necessarily opposed to Jesus so much. They may have some confusion there. But the church, instead of becoming a portal, has become a barrier. That should bother us, right? That should bother us. That should bother us a lot. Because here's the deal. Rejection is never a catalyst forward in someone's spiritual journey. No one ever goes, man, that church rejected me and I just fell on my knees and was just like, thank you for rejecting me. I, I've now come to the, the light of day has come. What are we thinking? People, yeah. right? Like we, we tell people like, oh no, you're not welcome here or you got to get your life this way or you're that way or you're orientated that way or this way or the other thing. And then we're like, man, I hope they come to Jesus. It's like wow. rejection is never a catalyst forward in someone's spiritual journey, right? We come alongside them, right? And so some of us, we need to throw that table, that barrier over as a, as a church. But it starts with us personally, right? We said it earlier this morning. Like if we're not personally there, then the church can't be there because the church is just made up of all of us personally doing our thing. So that, that barrier of exclusivity, we need to throw over. The second one is barrier of expectations. And this has been tough lately, if you've been paying attention over the last couple of years. Whatever your political leanings are, I honestly don't care. But I think we can all say that as we've merged more and more of that together into what it is to be the, the, the community of faith, it's gotten complicated for people. Yeah. Right? So now, before there was you know, that whole idea of what is Jesus and what, who is God and what's first like. And now we've added this layer of like, so, if, so if, if, if Jesus comes into my life, is this how I need to vote? Is this how I need to believe? Is this my politics? Right? And again, I love your, whatever your politics are, great, be passionate about it. But the problem is, once we, once we make that an expectation, right? Yeah. This is how you need to register. This is what party you need to be a part of. This is how you need to vote down. And it's like, when did, Jesus would say like, I'm turning that table yeah, over. That's like that's not, that's not what we're doing here, right? Go do that, it's fine, be active, be involved. But when we come together as a body of Christ, that, that is not, it's the connected and the disconnected. And that's what Jesus is about. So that's, that's something we're going to have to battle for a while to get to where we can start to reach people again without that being a thing. The last one is what I call the barrier of extracurricular. It started with E, so just bear with it, all right? But here's the idea. 
It's the idea of sometimes we, we, we are well-meaning, but in the church and as individuals, even as we're talking to people, we set up all this stuff that people need to do in order to qualify. Right? So we, we create all this activity around what we believe faith looks like. And, and that's good, right? You need to go to a small group. You need to serve. You need to serve the community. I mean, who has, I mean, right? Like we're like, I got 168 hours in a week, right? And so, I, again, all those things are good. You should do those things. Here at VIEW, we'll lead you towards some of those key things that will help you grow in your faith. My point is this, is that all those activities shouldn't be a barrier, where we exhaust people or we, we put this bar up like you need, if you need to start doing this, 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 and the other thing, those are great things. But Jesus would say, let's turn that table over and just give people access. And then as a result of their access, as a result of their connecting to Jesus, then some of those things will begin to be desired and wanted to do in their life. Let's not put the activities before the actual connection that goes on, right? Because barriers, barriers to belonging, if we exclude people, if we have expectations, there's all that extracurricular. Barriers to belonging will quickly become barriers to believing. Right? So it's more important for people to just feel like I'm a part. I can, I can journey. If you're watching today, if you're here today, like you're going, man, I, this church seems kind of cool. Like, is that right? It, do I have space to discover, to journey? Absolutely. Like, this, this is a place where we want that to happen. People, the people sitting around you today didn't, they, they have taken that journey as well and continue to be on that journey. Yeah. So let's make sure that we don't set those barriers in place that will be a burden for people. Because Jesus is standing in the temple court and he's saying, this is not how I see the world. Yeah. This is not how I divide the world up by who can pay and who has money and who, who can get, gain access through some other means. He, he didn't, that's not, you know, for God so loved the world, he sent his son into the world. He didn't do that for the connected people, right? He did that for, for all of us. To, and I get convicted talking about this because I'm a, I'm a professional Christian, right? I mean, that's, that's what you do, right? Except when I'm on an airplane, then I work for a nonprofit. <laughs> But, the, but, but here's the reality. Sometimes the longer we are in the temple, the more you know, time in erodes that awareness of. Yeah. So those religious leaders, they, they, they were probably shook up. And we always think we would have been with Jesus flipping. No, you wouldn't. You'd be the religious leader going, stop flipping my table. Right? Because the longer we're in, the more these things become natural to us, but also become very unnatural to the disconnected. Yes. A few years ago, my wife and I were um, looking for art, I know. Not an artist, all of that, but we had, we had built a, a, a lobby in our church and we were thinking, you know, what if we, as a means of reaching our community, but also because it's great, what if we get some local artists to put their art up in the lobby? You know, like kind of where you guys are in your coffee area. So we said, I don't know any artists. You know any artists? We're like, where do artists hang out? So in, in Las Vegas, they have uh, First Friday. You guys probably have some of those things around here, you know, where all the artists come out and there's restaurants and food trucks. So we thought, we'll go down and we'll just walk around in these galleries and, and try to find some people that might be willing to put our art up so we start walking around and we're walking through and there's a lot of art that's like yeah that's not going in our lobby right so what is that you know um <laughs> again if it was violent we'd like it but we're christians so we were like what is that um so we're walking around and, f and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're talking to a few artists and taking cards and, you know, not kind of not really. We're just kind of look and we walk into this. Basically, it was like a walk in closet. Literally, it was no larger than a closet. And there's this young gal sitting there probably in her early to mid 20s. And she's got this beautiful art on the wall. Just again, just connected with us like we were looking at it. And she paints these paintings with all this color and uses a lot of this female look with these huge, just piercing eyes that you just kind of get lost in. So we, I think we might have talked to her for a second, didn't say anything about it, took her card. And then a few days later, I sat down at my computer. And I emailed all these artists that we thought, well, maybe their art could fit in our church. And, and her name was Jen Main, Jennifer Main. So I emailed, hey, Jen, you know, saw your art at First Friday. Here, I'm a pastor here in town. Would you be interested in maybe putting some of your art up for display in our church building? I didn't get any response from any of the other three, but she emailed me back. And I remember her email, not the, all the content, but I remember her basically saying, hey, I'm curious about this opportunity, but I'd like to come to your church first and check it out, which I actually give her credit for that. Like, where am I hanging my art? 
And I remember a few weeks later, I'm up very similar size to this building we're sitting in today. And I look over and there she is sitting next to her boyfriend now, now husband. And I, I, she had like red crazy hair so I could pick her out like there she is. And she connected there. She, she wrote uh, just a few months ago, she, she shared with me, we're having lunch now and she's married and she continues to paint. She's moved to downtown LA. Um, but she continues to paint for us. Here's a picture of Jen and I um, this year during COVID. She painted, there's those eyes. She painted this picture with Psalm 23, the words of Psalm 23 superimposed underneath, right? Because God's got a hold of her life. Here's what she wrote to me about the, about the email. She said, I thought that was kind of odd when I got your email, but kind of cool. And then she put in parentheses, from my background at church, I never spoke to or got to know a pastor. They always seem so unreachable and unknowable on stage and giving sermons. She said, so I like getting an email from a pastor type. I was not going to church at that time. I was fairly suspicious of churches, even though I grew up growing, grew up going to church. Church had become, she said, something I figured was for well-dressed, well-to-do, judgmental, no fun, self-righteous hypocrites. Those people. I was secretly struggling with things and the last thing I wanted to do when I got your email was to join, join the I'm perfect, you're not church club. But I was curious. I went to church that week with my boyfriend, now husband, before I considered putting my, any of my art up. And these are hers, her words, and it connected. I had been living my way, which wasn't going so well and needed help, needing more of God and needing community. It changed my whole perspective and I began to heal from past experience. I realized that a healthy, perfectly imperfect church that relies on God's grace and love is a necessary part of God's plan. Let's be those people, right? Let's be those people. As the world kind of reemerges from the caves that we've been, the holes that we've been in, let's be those people. Because we got this moment where maybe the tables have been taken down. And so as people reemerge, let's fight the urge to set them back up. Right? If there are barriers that have been removed because of a pandemic that we've all hated, is there an advantage to going, let's make sure those tables never get set back up again. Let's make sure that those barriers of exclusion expectations never get set back up again because I believe God wants to use this church use us individually in ways we've never imagined if we will allow him again the drift is going to be back to the other thing and it starts with each of us starts with me right you all have your gin mains you may not know it yet you may have a story just like that but you all have your gin mains that you'll interact with tomorrow and the next day and the day after it's just a matter of will you be there when they're ready to connect? Will you be the one that will take the barriers down and say, come as you are, and let's discover a relationship with Jesus together. All right? Let's stand and pray. Can we do that? Father, we just pray right now in this moment, this challenging imagery that we have of you flipping tables, Jesus. God, we pray that we would be like you in that as well. God, that, that our hearts would remove all the fill in the blanks that we've used to separate people. So easy to do, God. So sinful in our lives. And God, that we would embrace, embrace, embrace just this simple idea of this individual's disconnected from you. Jesus, help us to be a catalyst for them to reconnect. Let us, let us make a way. God, that they could discover you and the transformation you want to do in their life and the eternal difference you want to make in their life. Let us be individuals that would do that. Come on. And let us be a church that would be known for that. That's our desire, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name.